Standing, open your Bibles to uh, Romans. Chapter 1, we'll read 8 through 17, verses 8 through 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers making request, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I may, be, may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Thus far God's word. You may be seated. A few weeks ago, as we took prayer requests, Beeson asked us to pray for him as he began to uh, play soccer. Now, Beeson and my grandsons are all part of uh, a Christian soccer league. And one of the qualifications for playing soccer is they have to go to practice. It's an obligation. And if they didn't go to practice consistently, then they wouldn't get to play. And so they know they must go to practice. It's an obligation. But they love to play soccer. And so the obligation isn't something they don't want to do because they glory in playing soccer. They gladly go to practice. Now, I give you that illustration to show you the relationship of obligation and pleasure. We have it in our marriages. There are things that as husbands that we will do for our wives out of obligation, but because we love them and because of the harmony, there's pleasure in doing those things. There's also things that we simply do out of obligation. Pay our taxes. I'm sure none of us have any pleasure in preparing or paying taxes. Uh, we have to do it. And there's things that are pleasurable, but are not obligatory like getting away on a Friday afternoon and, and playing golf. You know, it's something we would enjoy doing, but there's no obligation to do it. Well, for those of us who are in or preparing for the gospel ministry, these two things come together, obligation and pleasure. And it's very important in your understanding that these two things come together. They both need to be factors in your life, either as you serve in the ministry or as you consider ordination, seeking ministry, or as you serve in the church as an office bearer. Obligation and pleasure. What role do those things have in your life? How do you think about these things as you think about the ministry? Well, Paul gives us a very nice paradigm, a pattern here in verses 13 through 17 of this first chapter of Romans, how both of these factors were at work in his self-identification as a minister of the gospel. So, two weeks ago we looked at uh, the previous section, the Paul's talking about the apostolic foundation of the church. All of this he's writing to the Roman church to prepare them for his visit. So why does he want to come? Well, he, he wants to come that he might uh, strengthen them, that he might impart to them gifts, that they might have a, a foundation of fellowship. Uh, he's praying for them. But he seems to think that there are people in Rome that resent the fact that he's the apostle to the Gentiles and he's not 
been there. And so it's not the primary purpose of the book. The primary purpose of the book is to give them a, a treatise of the gospel. But a secondary purpose of Paul's is an apologetic to pave the way for his coming that it would be profitable. So he, he develops that theme now in verses 13 through 17. We can bring these verses together uh, under this theme that gripped by the glory of the gospel, the gospel minister is under obligation to preach the gospel. Gripped by the glory of the gospel, the gospel minister is under obligation to preach the gospel and to preach it to all people. So we'll look at two things. We'll see the obligation of the gospel minister and the motivation of the gospel minister. Paul begins with frankly expressing that he has an obligation. In verses 13 through 15, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I've planned to come to you and have been prevented so far that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm under obligation. I am indebted both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now he begins by expressing to them that it is his regret that he's not been there. He uses a phrase that he uses oftentimes, uh, I do not want you to be ignorant in verse 13. I don't want you to be unaware. And notice he speaks to them with affection. Some 14 times in this epistle, the apostle will use this endearing uh, address, brethren. Now sometimes as uh, ministers or other ministers can get these words that they use always in their sermons and they're almost like catchphrases, you know, beloved or brethren or friends. And we must be careful that we don't simply use those as catchphrases. When Paul uses a term like this, he is genuinely expressing affection. He's opening his heart to the people. And we must do the same thing and as we use these words, to use them uh, consciously expressing affection. So he doesn't want them to be ignorant. Basically, why have I not been to Rome? I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, why haven't I come to the capital of the Roman Empire. He says that often I've planned to come to you. He's got a parenthesis. We'll hold that off. Often I've planned to come to you so that I may obtain some fruit among you also even as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul says, it has been my desire to come to Rome. And it's been his desire to come to Rome because he's got one great purpose as a gospel preacher. He expresses it humbly, even though he is the apostle of the Gentiles. He says that I might uh, obtain some fruit among you also. Now, reference to how God's blessed his ministry. It's a fruitful ministry. And he wants to also find that fruitfulness in Rome to some degree. He's recognizing by the language that they have had others there. There is a church. And so he's not starting from scratch. But he wants to have fruit there. What is this fruitfulness that Paul desires? Well, I think we could simply summarize it that he desires to see people converted and built up in the faith. People come in to know the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel and through the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit to be established then so that individually uh, people will be transformed by the gospel. The families will be transformed by the gospel. The neighbors will be transformed by the gospel. But also there will be a church. A church that is being transformed by the gospel. Where God is being rightly worshipped. Where people are loving one another and, and learning to live together as brethren, as beloved, as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Now I think it's, it's very interesting for you to think about this. Oftentimes, as I interact with either ministers or, or people about to graduate about calls, uh, 
we must at this point recognize that our great reason for going to any church is not because it's near our parents or it's a part of the country in which we want to live, but that God has put a burden on our heart for those people that we might obtain some fruit among them. That must be the primary goal in accepting a call. Not that's the only call I have. That's not sufficient. If God has not given you uh, a desire for those people, for fruit in that congregation, then that's an indication that you're not being called there, and perhaps not called the ministry at all. This kind of thinking is absent in your life. So Paul is modeling for us right out of the gate as he talks about his desire to come to them uh, that this desire is to have fruit but he says I've been hindered and there's your parenthesis in my Bible it is actually in parenthesis I don't want you to be unaware brethren that I often have planned to come to you parenthesis and have been prevented so far he's establishing the truth here that his absence from Rome is not of his own choice his absence from Rome is of the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. Paul conducted his ministry in conscious dependence upon the leading of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 16, when he's, uh, 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 Luke is explaining why uh, they didn't minister in Asia or Asia Minor at that point, uh, the Spirit didn't leave them any freedom to do so. Uh, even though there were open doors as he will write later, as the Spirit closed that up to them, and through the process of a, of a burden, through a vision, led Paul to go across to um, Macedonia and Achaia. And so Paul was very sensitive to ministering where the Spirit would have him to minister. And this is what he explains then in chapter 15, What's the basis of this hindrance of not coming to Rome? I've been hindered up to now. Verse 22. Well, actually, let's start back with verse 18. I will not presume to speak anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem, round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I have often been prevented, hindered from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I've had for many years a longing to come to you, Whenever I go to Spain, for hope to see you in passing and be helped on my way there by you. So it was part of the broader gospel strategy that Paul was led to by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the places where there was complete uh, uh, paganism in the midst of the Gentiles. And this was a strategy led by the Spirit. And, but also you can see that al along the way he wanted to come and he kept being prevented from going to Rome. But now he's come to a subtle conviction that he will be led by the Spirit to go to Rome and preach the gospel. Now, another practical thing that I want you to note here is that um, Paul persevered in praying to go to Rome. I want to just a, a slight correction on what we heard in chapel yesterday. The, uh, the peril about the friend isn't that we come to God as a friend. The peril about the friend is that we come to God shamelessly and that we do keep asking until there is a clear answer. A temporary no is not a clear answer. Paul had temporary no's. No to Rome, no to Rome, no to Rome. Did he quit praying to go to Rome? No. God, in his sovereign fatherly wisdom, develops us, develops our faith by taking his time in answering our prayers. And part of laboring in prayer that Paul will talk about in Romans 15, 30 is this persevering, pleading with God. And so Paul gives us again another paradigm. 
He's pleading with God to go to Rome, and he doesn't stop. And he would not stop until he died. Because it's a legitimate thing to request for the apostle of the Gentiles to go and preach the gospel to the capital of the Roman Empire. And so it is in your praying. Don't ever grow weary. God will answer. About the only prayers that God answers immediately is when you're in immediate danger. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, he's training us. He's teaching us to depend upon him. He's developing our faith. And he wants us. And, and we're so, you know, we're laggards at this point. We start with intensity. God delays. And intensity grows cold. He wants us to learn to persevere. So Paul expressed this desire because, as he says then, I'm under obligation. He says, I have a debt to the Gentiles. Now he will go on to say that the gospel is preached to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. But you notice in verse 14, I'm under obligation. Literally, I am indebted both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. He says, there are no national barriers. He said, I am a debtor uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am under compulsion. Uh, take to the gospel to uh, every nationality. And so he divides the world into its two cultural divides of the Greeks and the barbarians, the civilized and the uncivilized. He divides the world culturally. Uh, he says, to the wise and to the foolish. To the great wise Greeks and Romans or to the, the foolish pagans that are out in the hinterlands. He said there are no restrictions to this obligation. That a, a burden has been placed upon him. A compulsion and indebtedness to take the gospel to all people in all places regardless of social standing. So what's the natural result of that in verse 15? So, for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So he's using this idea of compulsion uh, to show them that I, I have to come to you as soon as God allows me to come to you. It's part of my obligation. I'm under a compulsion uh, to preach the gospel to you. Paul develops this concept of his compulsion in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He explains why he doesn't take money for preaching the gospel. He's not establishing a pattern. He already established the principle that the, the minister lives by the gospel. But he says in verse 15, I've used none of these things and I'm not writing these things so that it would be done so in my case for it would be better for me to die than have any man to make my boast an empty one for I preach the gospel if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Now go on and talk about the fact that he does glory in preaching the gospel. But woe is me. He felt himself under a curse if he did not preach the gospel and to do so freely to all people. A couple of important points here. I've heard of a church in our area that has kind of restructured itself and it really wants to appeal to uh, uh, upper mobile class wealthy people. And they're structuring, they're identifying themselves in that manner. It runs absolutely counter to what Paul says here. God's not concerned in uh, racially segregated churches. He's not concerned in culturally segregated churches. He wants us to have this concern of the apostle multi-ethnic, multicultural, the, the, the wise and intelligent and uh, the, the poor and the ignorant, it matters not. We're going to see our gospel is for everybody. And thus our church needs to be for everybody. And that needs to be what motivates us. But the other thing that we have here is this is part of a considering a call to the gospel ministry. When we examine you in our various presbyteries about your call to the ministry, now this is the thing we're looking for. In the first place, are you compelled to preach the gospel? I think the way Spurgeon put it was, if you can do anything else, do it. He doesn't mean if you don't have 
uh, if you have gifts to do anything else. No, he means this compulsion. If you can be as happy teaching a school, plowing a field, building a house, uh, being a lawyer, then you don't have the compulsion. And I think one of the reasons that today men are out of seminary and then out of the ministry in five years after they're out of seminary is that there's no compulsion. It was a vocational track. What's well, a vocational track? But it's a divine vocation, gentlemen. And the, and the first imprint of that divine vocation in your heart is going to be, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. May that be what grips you today. Now, that'll manifest itself in a number of ways in how you approach your studies, but also how you approach other people. Are you now busy about evangelism? You'll hear stories about a man that wants to go to the mission field. Well, tell me who you've witnessed to. Well, I'll do that when I get to the mission field. Being a missionary is not going to make you an evangelist, is it, Dr. Curto? You go to the mission field because you are an evangelist. You go to the pastor because you are an evangelist. And so it manifests itself in our concern for the people around us. So seek from God this compulsion, uh, this indebtedness to, to preach the gospel in all places. And yes, you might be best suited for a particular kind of congregation, a particular kind of ministry, a church planner, a, a pastor of a stable congregation. But don't define those things so nearly. You ever cut yourself off from the field that lies before you as a gospel preacher. But you notice that this compulsion didn't mean that Paul was preaching the gospel um, unwillingly. No, he, he said in verse 15, I'm eager to preach the gospel. And this brings us to the second thing that we have here, and that is the motivation for the gospel minister. There is a compulsion. There is an indebtedness. But it does not grow out of Oh, I got to do this, you know, like I got to go cut the grass now because uh, if I don't, the neighbors are going to start complaining. No, or I got to pay my taxes. Uh, no, see this relationship, uh, the obligation was shaped by the pleasure, the motivation. And Paul develops it in a very tight, logical way. You'll notice as you look at 16, 17, and 18 that he, or 16 and 17, that he links arguments with the little word for. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome for. Now why is that, Paul? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now why aren't you ashamed of the gospel? Because, for, it's the power of God to salvation. How do you know that? For, because, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. So Paul develops here the glory of the gospel. And the glory of the gospel was the great motivation that compelled Paul to be a preacher of the gospel. First he says in the first part of verse 16 that he actually gloried in the gospel. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So, why am I eager to preach in Rome? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Perhaps there were the people who thought, well, Paul, yeah, the gospel works fine out there in the provinces, but are you afraid to bring the gospel here to the cosmopolitan center of the Roman Empire? You think it can't stand up against the, the philosophers and against the political and military power of the Romans? And Paul says, no way! I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now he's using here a rhetorical device, uh, litotes. could pronounce it litotes, but the dictionary doesn't. L-I-T-O-T-E-S. Litotes is where you express a positive statement negatively in order to emphasize the positive truth. So Paul would say of himself, I'm from a citizen of Tarsus, no small city. Or we'll say often the same kind of thing, and that simply means it's really a great city. So when he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he's actually using it in the negative to express that he glories in the gospel. As he says in, in Galatians chapter 6, we heard Dr. Dyer preach on that verse, I think it's verse 14, I boast in nothing but the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. I glory in the gospel. I boast in the gospel. I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, the, the rhetorical device emphasizes the, the glory of the gospel, but it also 
probably was chosen by Paul because there is a temptation, isn't there? To be ashamed of the gospel. Have you ever stuck your Bible under your briefcase on the airplane because suddenly you felt intimidated or there was really a, a very intelligent person sitting beside you or, or sometimes you just simply didn't want to be identified with the gospel because people would think you were a Bible banger or you were foolish or an idiot or sometimes are simply intimidated by uh, those around us. It's nothing new. Don't know what all was going on, but Christ had to come to Paul when he went to Corinth and said, don't be afraid any longer. And Paul had to instruct Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, 1, 6 through 8, don't be ashamed of me or of the gospel. It's a temptation. And surely it, is, it was a temptation for some of those people in Rome. Man, this is Rome. What's the gospel against the Roman Empire? Against the, the power of the Caesars? Against the, the paganism and the philosophy and the literature of Rome and of Greece? It was a temptation that we'll have to guard our hearts against all of our lives. Not to be ashamed of the gospel. But Paul helps us with this, with the next link. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for because it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. He said, the gospel is God's powerful message of salvation. Now, our little definition of the gospel I gave you the first sermon on Romans is that the gospel is the good news, and remember that's where we get this Greek word, the good news, that God is in Christ reconciling sinners to himself. That's the gospel in a nutshell. God is in Christ reconciling sinners to himself. And so when Paul talks here about power and salvation, he's being very frank. Men have a great need. Women have a great need. Children have a great need. They were born dead in our sins and trespasses. Thus we're under God's wrath and condemnation. And there's no deliverance in ourselves. But there's deliverance in the gospel. In the gospel message. But in the very proclamation of the gospel message, Paul is saying God does something powerfully. You see, it's a supernatural work to preach the gospel. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because, for, it's the power of God unto salvation. You see, it really is dynamite. This is a supernatural message that in its proclamation is blessed by the Holy Spirit to accomplish its results. So Paul will write to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. For this reason we constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. That's why we don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. That's why we don't have to be timid and afraid. We don't have to have all the answers to all of the atheistic and philosophical and scientific objections, because we've got a book that is powerful unto salvation. And all we have to do is tell people this message, and it's the message the Holy Spirit uses to create faith. And so yes, the message is given unto faith. It's a power of salvation to all types of people, all classes of people. It did go to the Jews first. Covenantally it went to the Jews. Even in Paul's preaching strategy, he would go to the to the synagogue and announce the fulfillment of all the prophecies and expectations of the Messiah, but to the Greek, because it works its purposes. Dr. Wilborn was telling me, we went to, went to supper Monday night, that his presbyteries think about hiring this guy to be a uh, M a liaison or something like that. His whole philosophy is we cannot plant churches the way we used to. We have to use women and entrepreneurs and all of these different things to plant churches. No. It's the gospel that converts. It's the gospel that builds up the church. It's what we refer to as the simple means of grace. 
It hasn't changed. It's going on for 6,000 years. And it's going to go until Christ returns. And those are going to be the churches in which there will be apostolic fruit. The ones established by the gospel. Now you're going to be tempted. And you're going to be pressured. Well-meaning people. Preacher, we need to do this. We need to tone down this. We need to, uh, to take these innovations. And you must be constantly nurtured at the feet of Christ Jesus that it is the simple gospel and the simple gospel alone that is going to convert and build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul can say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. But then he comes to the greatest glory in the gospel and that is the, he glories in the, the message itself. The third four, verse 17, because in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The gospel message is all about the righteousness of God. And I'm not going to go into all of the various ways you could look at this. Um, the law reveals God is a righteous God who exacts perfect justice. The Bible reveals God as one who is faithful and upright in all things. But none of that would be hope for us. That's why Luther hated this expression, the righteousness of God, until he understood that it's the gospel that reveals the righteousness of God. He uses the same phrase in chapter 3 when he says you can't be saved by works. No, apart from the law, the righteousness of God is manifested. It is this beautiful gospel message that God is in Christ reconciling sinners to himself by the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilling the law of God, offering his perfect life as a sacrifice for sinners. So all who believe in him are accepted by God, sins are pardoned, and are legally constituted righteous. And it's the only way that we can be legally, perfectly legally righteous in the sight of God is through the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why this message is so great. We couldn't do a thing for ourselves. God has done it all. It's God provided. It's God given. It's God accepted. This righteousness that belongs. This is Paul is introducing the theme now of the book. This righteousness of God and the simplicity of it. It's a righteousness that is a gift. And so it is simply received by faith. Paul uses a, a difficult phrase. He says it's to everyone who believes the Jew first, but for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And again, there's a lot of ways to understand this, but I think basically it's a righteousness that is received by faith offered to all those who believe. And so that's why Luther would coin the phrase that it's faith alone. That's what this double phrase is saying. Paul uses the same kind of language in Galatians 3.22. Uh, by faith, to faith, is that it's only faith. Yes, faith receives it, and it's only faith that receives it. Those who believe shall have this righteousness. And then he quickly confirms that because one of his goals in this book is to show that this is not a new message. Though it's revealed in the gospel, it was manifested in the law and the prophets, he'll say in Romans 3. And here he simply uses the prophet Habakkuk 2 for the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, Habakkuk is developing a broader principle there. That the entire Christian life is to be lived by faith. But the entire life is lived by faith. The entrance into that life must be by faith and by faith alone. Paul develops that as well in Galatians. And so, what Paul shows us here is that gripped by the glory of the gospel. The gospel minister is compelled to preach the gospel to all people, all places, all times. And uh, it then becomes for you and me the standard. Not only then are you feeling a compulsion to preach the gospel, but do you glory in the beauty of the gospel? Have you tasted it yourself <laughs> and you know that God is good? And you revel in the Lord Jesus Christ as your only hope.
Do you revel in the simplicity of the gospel? That it's simply a person's by faith, resting in Christ and Christ alone for this fantastic gift of righteousness. Are you nurtured by the gospel? Not just in coming to Christ, but every day of your life, reveling in, sucking on the beauty and glory of the free grace of the gospel. That must be your motivation. And that is your great sucker and help as those who will preach the gospel. But it's just a truth for lay people. We're all under obligation. Paul said, I've been bought with a price. I don't belong to myself. You don't belong to yourself. You boys and girls don't even belong to your parents. First of all, you belong to God. He put his sign upon you. He says, you're mine. He wants you to live for him. He wants all of us to live for him and for his gospel by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for uh, Paul's love of the gospel, Paul's compulsion to preach the gospel. May it be our love and our compulsion as we serve you in the gospels, we serve you as men preparing for the gospels, we serve you as men and women in your church. For Christ's sake, amen.